In this video, I'll continue with the introduction to 3D Max software. So I'll start with the tube. Just click on create geometry. It's already selected. Then I'll click on the tube button. Then I'll specify the center point by clicking. Then I'll just drag to specify the radius one and then radius two. Then I release the mouse. Then I move the mouse all the way upwards to specify the height of the tube. Now this particular option remains selected. And if you want to go out of this option, you have to select some other operation or else you can just right click here to go out of this command. Now you can see that this object remains in the selected state and the selected object shows all the edges in the shaded viewport and in the wireframe viewport you can see that the color of the object will be white. Now where exactly is it specified? For that you just right click at the display representation area then you have a configure button over here in the configure button, you can configure a number of parameters. Here we have visual style appearance tab. Just click on that. Over here, the selected objects representation is checked as display selected object with edge surfaces. That is why a selected object is displayed with such a representation. Now, if you click on this option, that is a selection in brackets. And if you disable the display selected with edged faces, so let's see what happens. So the selected object will get surrounded with a white box and the color of the object will remain as white in the wireframe viewports. There are two shortcuts in 3D Max related with the display representation of objects. One is F3 function key. When you press F3, it will go back to wireframe representation. Now when you press F3 again, it will come back to the previous representation which was the realistic. So you can easily switch over between these two representations. The next function key is F4. When you press F4 function key, you will get edged face representation. Now when you press F4 again, you will get the default continuous shaded representation. These two keys can be often used as and when required. Next, I'll create a plane on the bottom of this tube. So I'll click on the plane command. I'll just right click to activate the top view. I'll click the first corner here and opposite corner here. Now you can see that you have a plane here and you will also see a shade of this particular tube falling on the plane. That is because by default in realistic shading, the software displays the shadow effect. In 3D Max, the software keeps a light at the position of the camera. The shadow effect is due to the presence of that particular default light. Presently, we have only the tube object, so it won't take much time to show the shadow effect on the screen. But if there are too many objects, the software has to work considerable amount of time to show the shadow effect on the screen. In that case, you can temporarily suppress a display of shadows by right clicking here. Then you go to lighting and shadows and you can just disable the shadow effect. So it won't be there. Okay. So I'll go to lighting and shadows and activate it. Okay. But in the shaded representation, the shadow effect won't appear, but it won't be as superior as a realistic representation since it shows the effect of materials. But here you can't make out any difference since I haven't applied any materials onto this object. Next, I'll increase the number of segments on the face of this tube. So I'll just click on the tube. Then I'll increase the number of segments along the height. Okay. Then I'll increase the height slightly more. I'll also increase the segments along the sides so that the curvular edges will remain as smooth. Okay. Next, we will see the procedure to alter this object. In 3D Max, you can alter an object in two different ways. The first method is by transforming it and the second method is by modifying it. So let's see the transformations first. In the toolbar, we have three buttons which are exclusively meant to transform an object. The first one is select and move. Second one is select and rotate. And the third one is a select and scale. These three buttons along with the coordinate setups which are available here and the transform centers that means the center point about which these transformations are to be applied are collectively called transform managers. Now let's see the select and move button first. So I'll just click over here and I'll select the object. So you will see an access report appearing here representing X, Y and Z axis. This is called a transformation gizmo. By default, this gizmo will remain on and this will give you an idea about the direction in which you perform the transformations. If you want to move the object in the X direction, take the cursor onto the X axis. So the color of that axis gets changed, which is an indication that now you are constrained or restricted the move transformation along this axis. Now just move the mouse. You can see that the object will get moved along the X direction. You can just right click the mouse to cancel this operation. 
Then you take the cursor onto the Y axis and you can move it. Right click again to cancel it. Take the cursor onto the Z axis. Then you move it up and down. Okay. And you can right click to cancel the transformation. So this is how you perform move transformation. While you perform move, if you hold down the shift key and when you move it, you will be getting a copy of it. Okay. And you will be moving that particular copy. Again, right click to cancel this. And you can give precise numeric inputs when you move. But for that, you should know the units first and the coordinate setup. Here you can see an X, Y and Z axis and this stands for the world coordinate setup. Whereas this is the transformation gizmo which is used to transform an object. Now when you right click here, all the units are given in centimeters. In fact, in 3D Max, you can set the units. Just click on the customize tab and here you have unit setup. Now presently the metric is chosen. We have four system of units here. One is metric in which you can access centimeters, millimeters, meters. Then US standard in which you can go for feet and inches. Then you have custom unit in which you can specify a particular scale. Then in generic units also you can go for. Now I clicked on metric and centimeters because that's what I want. Next I'll just right click here. Here you have absolute world and offset world. Offset world means any values you give will be taken with respect to the existing position of the object. Suppose if I want to move this object through a distance of 50 cm in the x direction, all I have to do is just type the value 50 there and give an enter. Now it has moved 50 units rightward in the x direction. Similarly, I can move in the y and z axis direction. But if you give any values here, that will be taken with respect to the world coordinate setup. But generally, the transformations are done with respect to the existing position. Next, we will see select and rotate icon with which you can rotate an object about any axis. The X axis represented in red color and when you click like this, when you move the mouse like this, it will be rotated about the X axis. You can also rotate an object about the Y axis like this. Now Y axis is shown in green color. You can also rotate it about the Z axis. We have a snap button here and it is the angle snap. And if you want, you can rotate through predefined angular increments like this. Okay. And if you want, you can control the values here. Just right click at the angle snap and the present value for the angle snap is 5 degrees. I can make it to 10 degrees for example. Now if I try rotating it about the x axis in each 10 degree increments, it will get rotated. So that is also another method to rotate an object. You can also right click here and you can specify the values in degrees. Suppose if I want to rotate this object about y axis through 45, I can just type 45 here. So it got rotated. Okay, I'll just press Ctrl Z to undo this change. So likewise, you can perform rotation and you can also perform scaling. But at the scale button, you will see a triangle appearing here at the lower right corner. When you just hold down your mouse here, there are three types of scaling. One is called the uniform scale in which you can control, you change the scale in the uniform manner. And second one is called the non-uniform scale in which, in which the scale of the object can be controlled along one axis. Okay, for example, about Y axis, I can control the scaling. Then you can also perform another type of scaling that is called squashing. In squashing, that is the third type of scaling. What happens is when the size of the object will get reduced in one direction, it will get increased in the opposite direction so that the overall volume of the object will remain the same. That is squashing. Now I'll go back to the uniform scale. You can also activate percentage snap to scale an object in a certain percentages. Just right click on the percentage snap. Now you can see that the percentage snap is presently set at 10 percentages. That means after activating the percentage snap, if you try to scale this object in each 10%, the size will get enlarged as well as reduced. So likewise, you can control it. When you transform an object, the position of the transformation gizmo changes with the viewports. I'll switch over to four viewport configuration by pressing Alt W. In this viewport, the transformation gizmo is in such a way that the XP plane is aligned with the base of the object and Z is pointed upwards. Whereas when you just activate this viewport, which is a front viewport, you can see that the XY axis of the transformation gizmo is parallel to the view plane. The moment you activate the top view, the transformation gizmo will get parallel to that particular viewport. And same is the case with the left viewport. So the transformation gizmo will remain parallel to the viewport if you activate an orthogonal or 2D viewport such as friend, top, left, etc. Whereas in a 3D viewport such as a perspective viewport, the transformation gizmo 
will get aligned in such a way that the xy will be parallel to the base of the object and z will be pointed upwards. Now when I activate, now I'll activate this viewport and I would like to change this into a 3D viewport. For that I'll just press the alt key and the scroll wheel simultaneously to get a 3D view. So this is not a perfect isometric or a perspective. It is called a user view which can be generated if required. Now I'll go back to the front view by pressing the letter F or else you can just press on this orthographic and you can select friend here. I'll type F to switch over to that view. Similarly you can switch over to left view by typing the letter L and to get the top view you can activate the viewport and type the letter T. And for the perspective it is P and for the camera it is C. So we will see that when we create the camera. So this is all about transformations. Now what exactly are modifications? See modifications are applied by using modifiers. For that you have to just select the object and go to modify panel and we have already seen that we can modify the object name, the wireframe color. But when you just click on this particular arrow, you will see a number of items here and each of these items are called modifiers. Now I would like to apply a taper modifier. So each of these modifiers can be used to change the physical geometry of an object. Now I would like to give a taper modifier. So you can keep the cursor over here and type the letter T. So you will see all the modifiers starting with the letter T. I'll just click on taper and you can just work on the spinner to give a value for the taper. Okay, that is the amount of taper which is 0.86 and you can also taper it along a curve like this. Now it is tapered along a curve inward or it can be tapered outward. So I'll taper it inward. So that is a modifier which is applied to it, a taper modifier. So I'll apply the next modifier that is called bend modifier. So I'll click on this arrow and I'll keep the cursor over here and I'll type the letter B which is the first letter of bend. Now I've got the modifier bend. Okay, now I can give the angle of the bend like this. You can bend in this direction or in this direction. Okay, you can also specify a direction for the bend. Let it be this direction. Now I'll apply the next modifier which is twist. So keep the cursor over here and type the letter T for that. Okay, now you will see the twist gizmo. This orange box is called a gizmo. Since the modifier is twist, this is called a twist gizmo which actually completely surrounds the object. Now you can change the angle of twist by giving a suitable value for the twist. You can also give a bias if you want for the twist. So I have applied three modifiers here. Now I have started with the tube. Now when you just click on the tube, you can change any of the creation parameters of the tube such as the radius 1, 2, height, segments, etc. I'll change the height of the tube. So it will get reflected on the final object. And now if you feel like you want to change the taper, so just click on the taper and you can change the value. So it will also get reflected on the final object. And hence this particular area is called the modifier box or modifier stack. And this modifier stack actually displays the complete construction history of an object. So by simply by looking at the stack, you can be sure that you have started with the tube, then you have moved on to taper, bend and twist. And at any point of time, you can just turn off the effect of a particular item in the stack by clicking on this bulb. So when you just click on this bulb, the bend modifier is temporarily turned off. Now when you just click once again, it will come back. Similarly, you can turn off the twist. You can also alter the order of items in the stack. For example, I can just select the taper and put it after the bend. So what happens? This is the result of a tube which is bent first, then tapered and twisted. Okay. You can also put the twist before the taper. So this will be the effect. And likewise you can change the order of items in the stack. I'll just undo these changes by pressing Ctrl Z. You can permanently delete an item from the stack by selecting that particular item and you just click on this delete icon. So that particular item will get removed permanently from the stack. So when you save the file, the stack information will also get saved along with it. And this information will actually add to the file size. So once you have completed the model, you don't need to retain the stack items. So what you can do is you can just convert this object into a mesh object. The moment you convert this object into a mesh object, all the stack items will get deleted and hence you can save the file size. So and how will you convert this into a mesh object? For that, just select the object, right click and you have convert to option editable mesh. Now this becomes an editable mesh. The moment an object changes to editable mesh, the software memorizes this object 
in terms of a number of vertices, edges, faces, polygons and elements. Element means the entire object. So when you click on element level and select the object, the entire object will get selected. But if you click on polygon and if you select like this, all the a number of polygons over here will get selected. Now you can apply any modifier into this. For example, if I want, I can just scale. So only that particular polygon will get scaled. Then if you want, you can select the face. A face is nothing but a triangle. Okay, you can use the standard window to select the number of triangles, which are faces. Then you can just scale those faces. So that will be applicable only onto those triangles. Now you can come to edge level and you can select one or more edges using the selection methods. Okay, edge is nothing but a line. Like this you can select. Then you can also select the vertices. Vertices are nothing but the dots. Vertices are found at the endpoints of an edge. So if you come to vertex level and if you select a number of vertices, then you can perform any transformations on it. Like I can scale it. Okay, then I can rotate it. So likewise, a mesh object is made up of vertices, edges, phases, polygons and elements. You can move on to any desired subobject levels and you can perform any transformations on it. Okay, so the objects which are imported from AutoCAD 3D Max are treated as mesh objects by 3D Max software. So you can perform all these transformations on those objects which are actually imported from AutoCAD. And you can perform selections by clicking on these icons as well. You can click on vertex level by clicking on this icon, edge, face, polygon, elements, everything is obtained here. So this is how you modify objects in 3D Max. Now to create objects, in fact, we have a number of tools here, but in our approach, we create all the engineering models using AutoCAD. Since AutoCAD model is 100% accurate and you will be able to perform fast modeling using AutoCAD and you will be importing those models to 3D Max and we will see the procedure to import in the coming videos. You can create shapes, lights, cameras, etc. using these buttons. But in 3D Max, there is an interface to create materials that is called the materials editor, which can be obtained by clicking here or else you can type the letter M for materials editor. Okay, the default view in 3D Max 2015 is called the slate view. You can switch over to compact materials editor by clicking on this button. And in our coming tutorials, we will be sticking onto this particular interface of materials editor to create, edit, access, apply as well as to save materials. So we have exclusive videos on materials editor. Another setting that is to be done before you import a model from AutoCAD 3D Max is the gamma correction. For that, you just come to a rendering gamma LUT setup. Okay, over here we have a gamma option. Here you can see an outer square and an inner square. And you can see two shades of gray here. Okay, so you have to adjust the value of this gamma in such a way that these two shades of gray will merge each other and you will be able to hardly make out the difference between these two shades. So I'll reduce the value first and you can see that it is getting changed and it is almost merging. Okay, this value is pretty okay. Okay, once these two shades will get merged, you have a perfect gamma and the value of gamma changes from monitor to monitor. So depending upon your monitor, you have to change this value. Now you have got the proper contrast. Next you can go for a render. So just click on a render setup icon over here. Then you can select the resolution. These are the standard resolutions. But if you want you can go to HD resolution. When you go to HD TV resolution you will get uh, HD resolutions here. Okay I'll select this one. Then you click on render. Okay, this is not the actual size, this is 1 is to 2. So just maximize this window and you can just scroll the scroll wheel once to get the actual dimension. Now it is 1 is to 1 size. So this is how you render a model using the render setup icon. So that's all about an introduction to 3D Max. With this information in mind, you can proceed to the next videos to explore various videos right from importing a model to creating cameras, lights, applying materials to creating a simple camera animation for dynamic visualization. So let's see these videos.